Welcome to the media ministry of Lake Highlands Church. Our speaker today is the senior pastor, Dr. Jim Reynolds. I say this every week, but it's always a, I'm really blessed by being here, by you being people of praise and faith, and us encouraging each other. Uh, this morning, I'm talking about Jesus and his trial, his, t- his testing, his temptation. Uh, before that, I do that, uh, the generation ahead of me and my family are all deceased except for my mother's sister who's sitting here, uh, Sue Bolton, uh, 89 years old. She's been in the same church in Pueblo where our family was for 65 years. <laughs> so, and she has been shepherding and has the stories to prove it for a long time. And uh, it's just good that she's here with us Amen. and that we're all here. And uh, Just thank God that we're all here. Lord, we thank you for today, and we thank you for Jesus, and that he has redeemed our lives. We praise you. Bless us now as we reflect on Jesus, as we have sung about him. Let's reflect and pray and recommit ourselves to Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 4, 1 to 13, Jesus is out in the wilderness. It's usually called a temptation. I think it was really a training, and it was a testing. Think of the Cowboys training camp. The Cowboys are in their season now, but they couldn't do a season without a training camp. Think of the Rangers just clinched the American League West, but they had first a spring training in February. Even entertainers train. Entertainers train. That's what these people are. They train to provide the entertainment. Luke 4 is about something way more important than the Cowboys training camp or the Rangers spring training. It's about the testing of the Son of God. It's about the salvation of the world. Jesus' training and entertainer's training is what happens after the identity is established. You sign a contract with the Dallas Cowboys, you're a Dallas Cowboy. That's your identity. You go to training camp. You play the season. You sign a contract with the Texas Rangers, you're a Texas Ranger. That's your identity. You go to spring training in February. You play the season beginning in April. This is how that works. And so in the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel doesn't start with the training. It starts with the identity of Jesus. The identity of Jesus is is established in his baptism. This is the Son of God. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Then there's a genealogy that tells you who he is, traces him all the way back. So the identity is established. Now he goes to training camp. That's what the testimony, the, that's what that time in the wilderness is about. And so in Luke, he frames it this way. There is identity, there is training camp, and then there's the ministry. It's at, and there is what he came to do. There is what you would call the season. But the season doesn't begin until you know who you are until you've been trained, and then you go out. And so after the training of Luke 4, 1 to 13, he preaches, and he casts devils out. The devil actually tries to become his buddy out in the wilderness. He doesn't. He heals people. He disciples people. And he says, the Son of Man must suffer. Satan tries to talk him all out of that, out in the training. And then he says, if you want to follow me, deny yourself and take up the cross and follow me. He that loses his life will save it. So 
that all happens after the training. The training is what I call a showdown. It's a war of two worlds. Everything else in the Gospels is a kind of mopping up. The, the, the Luke 4, 1 to 13 is not so much a temptation, it's a testing, because you know who sends Jesus out to the wilderness is the Holy Spirit. He arranges the confrontation. Sometimes, I want to tell you, when your life is really hard, it's not Satan, it's God. He's testing you. And you get tested periodically because you've got stuff to do now. You've got stuff tomorrow that you've got to do that you're not ready to do now. I want to tell you, that's the case. At this age, I got tested to do this. You get tested along the way. This is how this works. And so Satan, no, I mean, the Spirit knows what Jesus is, is going to get. He knows the, the Satan is coming for him. So what does he do? He says, don't eat for 40 days. Don't eat. And fasting is a good thing. Fasting is, is lifted up, but I don't think this was about fasting. It was about weakening Jesus. He, the Spirit says, don't, don't eat, and then he leads him into the wilderness. He is testing him to prepare Jesus for what is coming. Because, see, Jesus is God's agent. And the devil or Satan is going to come in full force to attack him because Jesus threatens Satan's very existence. Satan knows that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world in the sense that it's like the kingdoms of this world, but it is for this world. So if the kingdom of God is for this world, we got a war. Because there's somebody else who wants to be in charge. And the Spirit designs testings. Hear this. When you get tested, and when Jesus is tested, he gets tested to make clear to Jesus and us, who are we? When it really gets hard around here being a shepherd, I get tested. Who am I? You get tested as to who you are and what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do? It gets hard, are you going to quit? If it gets hard, are you going to quit? If you can't forgive, are you going to quit? That's the kind of things that are worked through in the testing. You don't wait till you get in the battle. You got to have some training going on before you get in the battle. Because if, if you're not trained at all, you're going to just act like the world. I'm going to act like the world in the battle. See, clarity comes from resisting. Let me, a quick football example. Those are the kinds of stuff that's on everybody's mind. Everybody talked about Zeke Elliott, first round draft choice, going to be the greatest player in the world. Well, not so quite yet. He hits the line and he fumbles. You know why? Because somebody hit him. When you get hit, are you going to fumble? A lot of us, we get hit, we fumble. In fact, we ask to be taken out. We raise our hand, I like to be taken out. Jesus is not going to take you up. I want to sub in. He doesn't have one for you. He doesn't have one for you. And you fumble? He's going to keep giving you the ball. He's going to keep training you till you figure out how to get hit and not fumble the ball into the opposition's hands. And they're going the other way. So even if you're a first-round draft choice, you're hurting your team. We hurt our team. We got all these gifts, but every time it gets hard, oh man, I don't know what I'm going to do. Clarity, see, comes from resisting and affirming your identity and doing mission when nobody claps. Woo! Nobody. There's nobody clapping. There's no friends on Facebook. Nobody. When everybody's clapping, you're not being a disciple. You're not. It's just fun. That's not, that's not what the way the world's built right now. When the pain comes, what do you do? 
See, the clarity comes from engagement with the enemy. It comes from hitting the scrimmage and they hit you. That's when clarity comes. Do I want to be a runner? Do I want to I want to carry the football? See the attack and Satan's really cool about this. Satan's attack is not aimed at your person. It was not aimed at the person of Jesus, but it was aimed at the purposes of God in Jesus. Are you going to be cruciform or superhero? That's it. Are you going to be shaped in the image of Christ and his, his, are you going to be willing to suffer as he suffered for us? Or are you going to be superhero? I know preachers who have quit because they just could not become superhero. We all thought in seminary we were going to grow up and be superheroes. What Bible were we reading? What were we reading? What was the water we were drinking? What are we doing in our lives? The prosperity gospel tells you you're going to be a superhero. God doesn't need any of those. He needs people who are cruciform people, who will die for their loved ones, who will die for Jesus, who will die for their kids, who will die for the kids in the neighborhood, other people's kids. See? So he doesn't argue Jesus. The attack is, see, the attack of Satan is really personal and seductive. The most seductive thing about this in reading it and so far the revelation I get from it is, see, Satan doesn't argue with Jesus' identity. He says, you know what? I think you probably are the son of God. Well, that's kind of seductive because the Pharisees and Sadducees were saying, no, you're not. Satan's cool. He says, I think you are. He kind of... He starts off really strong. He doesn't argue with Jesus' identity. He argues from his identity. And that's scary. That's deceptive. Oh, yeah, you're really cool. You really are the son of God. And so what he does, what he's doing is, it's pure flattery. He doesn't give a rip about Jesus. If you had somebody tell you how cool you are, they don't give a rip about you, but you just bought in all the way. Flattery. And then, you know, with a smile, he attacks. With a smile. See, this is why Jesus, he got to him. He got to Jesus. Jesus is tested. He's tempted. It was hard. It was hard. It was difficult. Satan got to him, but he did not turn him. He did not defeat him, and he did not overcome him, and he did not fill Jesus. He did not occupy Jesus. But it was tough. It's tough to be tempted. I hate it. When I get through it, I don't feel like I won, but I did. God did. I'm being refined. I'm figuring out, what do I do? Here's my identity. What are you going to do, Jim? Are you willing to suffer for that? You get, you, he was, Jesus was being shaped by resistance. He was being shaped by resistance to deception and to half-truths. You know, beyond being born again, there's got to be transformative formation. We got to be formed into something, guys. Being born again, most overrated thing in the world in the church. We just keep talking about it, talking about it. And a bunch of kids that just can't quit screwing up and, and messing in their diapers are in the church. We got to grow up. Transformative mission. I know y'all are, but just, and I'm all for being born again, but I'm all for transformative mission and transformative formation. Your lives, at the end of the day, are full of joy if there's some kind of formation going on. See, Jesus is very hungry. He's weakened. So the Spirit sets it up that the test is tougher by design. It's easy to blow off Satan when you feel really good and things are going your way. How many, how many times did, did temptation get really hard because you just felt lousy? So here's what happens. He comes to him and he tells him three things and he responds. He says, turn the stones into bread. 
Now notice that he tempts Jesus as to what Jesus can do. I can't turn stones into bread, so he's never tempted me to do that. Either, probably you either. But he tempts you with what you can do. He builds on who you are and who, what you can do. And he speaks to you there. He says, you're wasting your time if you're a humble servant. You could be the superhero. What, you wasted these years? You could have been the superhero by now. So turn his stones into bread. Deuteronomy 8, 3 is Jesus' response. We'll get to that in a minute. Then he says, worship Satan and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Jesus comes back, Deuteronomy 6, 13. Then he says, jump, do a temple jump. Do a temple jump. That will really work. And test God, he'll come. We'll get a crowd there is what he's kind of saying. I can imagine. You know, we can get everybody in Palestine there. They'll see this. So this is happening. Now realize this. This is one thing I think sometimes we leave out. This actually is going on not in an air-conditioned room. This testing is going on in what's called the wilderness of Judea. It is 25 miles long, north to south, and 15 miles across. If you're in the big middle of it, there's no bread within walking distance for over a day. It's not, there's not any tourists out there. There's, it's tough out there. It's scary out there. You hear the howling at night, 40 days. He's hungry out there. They're testing that Son of God is being tested for the biggest battle in the history of the world. The destiny of the world is on the line. So this is a test. But it's in a wilderness. It's in the wilderness. You hear the howls of the animals. It's about all you hear. He's wrapped up in his robe. If it's cold, he's sweating, he's really hot because it goes down into the Dead Sea. It's one of the starkest, harshest places on the planet. That's where this is happening. That's where he responds. He says, and the other thing you need to understand is that Jesus quotes the same book three times. It is the book written to Israel 1,500 years before when she was in the same place, in the wilderness. It was the word of God then for Israel, what Jesus is saying, it's still the word of God. Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 8 gets Israel through the wilderness if they obey, gets Jesus through. So this is what he's about. At one point, Satan gets the eye, realizes Jesus just keeps quoting scripture and he quotes Psalms 91, Satan. Let's quote Psalm 9111. Totally out of context, obviously. Just butchers it. But you know what? He comes on strong, like some preachers just butchering the Bible. Jesus comes back. It's Deuteronomy. It's the word from the wilderness. That's the word. See, there's a wisdom from the past that we can learn from. You're not on your own when you're being trained. There's the resources of Scripture. There's the resource of the Holy Spirit and the church to enrich us within the testings. Now, let's talk about, he says, first of all, the first temptation or first testing, tell this stone to become bread. Well, that's, like I said, that's that's the test because it's a day to get any bread. And Jesus is hungry. What can it hurt to, to zap one stone? and get a loaf. What can it hurt? What can it hurt to do the stuff you do by yourself nobody knows? What can it hurt? But Satan does not argue with Satan. Jesus does not argue with Satan, but he quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. We cannot live by bread alone, but by the words of God. I just sort of see him saying this, bread can keep you alive, but it cannot give you a life. And if I do what you're doing, I'm going to lose my life and get bread. Bad trade. 
So also, he knows the Spirit has led him out there, and he's hungry, and it's all, a, it's all what the Holy Spirit's done. So you know what Jesus says? He says, I'm going to finish what we started here, even when it hurts. So the message for us is, do not go buy a dozen donuts to medicate the pain or anything else. Let the Spirit finish what the Spirit is doing. The second, t- is, the second test or temptation is to worship Satan and receive the kingdoms of the earth. Now, that one just seems, come on, Jesus, that one was easy. I think it was part two of that temptation that got to Jesus. I will give you the world. They will, they will come to you and give you their allegiance, and you won't have to go through the cross You won't have to go through all this preaching where you're pleading with the world to repent. All that will be a done deal. I'll give it to you. That second part was really a test. Because, and and he's out there in the wilderness. I'll get allegiance of the world, though, without a cross. But then he realizes, I cannot worship Satan. You know. The end does not justify the means. You want to do a good deal for somebody, but you're doing something bad? It'll really work well for my family if I'll do this. End does not justify the means. Deuteronomy 6, 13, he quotes right back. Worship God. Two words. Worship God. He uses scripture. He's in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's not on his own. Third test, third temptation. He calls Jesus to test God. He says, jump off the top of the temple. He guarantees adulation and worship. Imagine, it will go viral on the internet for a thousand years. Not not for six months, a thousand years on the internet. You will be the star forever. What I see in our day and time, the way this would have worked, he said, Jesus, I want you to get a motorcycle and get back up and just take off into the air. Shoot off that temple. Back in the day, there was a guy that did this. Some of you are old enough to know about a man named Evil Knievel. Evil Knievel went around doing stunts. He had one where he jumped all over part of the Grand Canyon. I thought it was going to be the end of him. Somehow he lived through it. I'm not sure what. But he was a stunt artist. He, he basically broke every bone in his body and lived to tell about it. He got praise. He made a lot of money. Satan wants Jesus on a motorcycle flying off the temple. And see, what will happen is people will clap. But maybe, and, and there will be this applause, and Jesus will be seduced by that. He'll become addicted to the applause. And you know what's really more important? If Jesus starts tumping, jumping off temples and getting all this applause, he's never going to get on a cross. If you start that, you just don't end up on a cross. Jumping off temples? And getting all these and going viral on the internet, and that becomes your addiction. You love the crowd, and everybody's giving you these emails telling you they saw you and texting and all the other ways. You're just not going to end up on a cross. That's what this whole thing's about. It's about he's talking him out of, trying to talk him out of the cross. At the end of these temptations, these tests, it says that Satan left for a more opportune time. You know, if you read Luke really carefully, what was the opportune time? He hits him the night before the cross. He just works him really hard. He comes back at him full force. That was what it was all about to begin with. And so what looks really, what looks really harmless, jumping off a temple, when you know God's going to come get you, maybe, is it really so harmless? What he's doing is turning him and, ch- and changing him. If you want to follow Jesus, do not expect applause. 
Do not expect to be the most popular person in the world. You will be rejected. You will be rejected even by your own people some of the time. This is, you know, this is simply not what we do. Yeah. And another thing he's doing, he's, he tries to tri- he's trying to trivialize Jesus' power. You've got this power, so do this. But it just makes Jesus look like a fool. You know, we can be made to look like fools. There's nothing. It's, 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 it's trivial. Go ahead and do it. And so our, our whole life just becomes kind of nonsense of trivial pursuits. Jesus is, because Jesus is quoting Scripture, Satan quotes Scripture, Psalms 91.11, as I already said. Jesus quotes back Deuteronomy 6.16. You shall not test God. Don't have conversations with Satan. Quote Scripture at him. You have conversations, you know, that's not good. It's not going to go anywhere. You're being tempted and you're talking to the voice. See, I don't think all this was all that easy. I think he got who the voice was, but I don't think Satan came up with this Satan word written across his chest. That's not the way Satan works. There's a voice. Do we recognize the voices? Do you know the voices? Do you know the voice of God? Do you know the voice of other people? What does it sound like? And do we know the voice of Satan when it speaks? If we, beca- if we listen well, we do. Jesus is tempted, he is tested more importantly, and he is faithful. You know, he is God's agent, and he is competent. He has engaged the enemy and won. He has carried the football through the line of scrimmage, and the linebacker and the defensive tackle hit him right where he was carrying the ball, and he did not fumble. He carried the ball. He did what he was called to do. He was trained. And so, Satan leaves. See, Satan's not all-powerful. It's God who is relentless. It's God who is everywhere. You know, he has engaged the enemy. He has taken the first step in being a suffering servant king. Nobody ever heard of a suffering servant king. This is why we know that when we are tested and we are tempted, that he is in the trenches with us as is no other. He identifies with us. We are tested to be faithful under pressure. We're called to live to die. Let's fast forward for a minute and talk about Satan. I mean, Stephen for just a few minutes. Stephen comes in the wake of Jesus. A couple of years later, a young man, Stephen, is announcing Jesus. He is a disciple. He is trained. He is tested. He is described like Jesus as full of the Holy Spirit. Says it like three or four times. He lives inside the presence of Jesus. But the presence of Jesus is living, is calling him to witness for Jesus. In Acts chapter 7, at the temple, he starts preaching. He declared that God was and is working. He says, but you missed it, you Jews. You killed the, and he is a Jew. He's a Hellenistic Jew. You killed the prophets in Jesus, and there's a violent reaction, and the mob rushes to take him out. I want to tell you, when I read chapter 7 of, of the book of Acts, I'm saying Stephen is courageous like Jesus. I'm going to, you know what, what I'm going to typically say if you start screaming at me, if this whole group starts screaming at me and rushing, I'd say, wait a minute, I must have misspoken. <laughs> Let me try that point again. Okay, I'm going to go back over to my notes here and think, I missed it. Let's do that again. Stephen doesn't do that. You know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit living in you. You got the guts to go down and die. Now, in Luke 9, it actually said that. That if you come follow me, you will die. But we don't think that's literal. 
Everything on both sides, we think that's literal. But not that. Yeah, I think that was. And I think Stephen understood that. And I think Stephen needed, you know, he understood that he needed to say this. This was crucial. These people understood what they had done to God. He testifies to Jesus and the power of the Spirit in a hostile world. And then you know what happens? Jesus is there. And Stephen says, they're all, they're throwing the rocks at him. And he says, I see heaven opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He's not sitting. He's gotten up. Jesus is up. Up on behalf of Stephen. Up. That's my guy. Jesus is talking to the God. That's my guy. And he's letting Stephen know. They say you are insane. They're killing you. You're my guy. He sees him. See, Stephen said, guy, this is the guy who, when he, you were trying him, he said, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of God. <laughs> well, Stephen's saying, I'm seeing him. I see the one who told you he would be at the right hand of God, the one you killed. See, Stephen doesn't back off like I would and say, we've got a misunderstanding here. We don't have a misunderstanding here. We've got a world where people are in opposition to God, where sometimes we are. In opposition to God. Stephen has been confessing Jesus, know this, before men. Now Jesus stands confessing Stephen before the Father. Put your name in there. Randy has been confessing Jesus before men. Now Jesus stands confessing Randy before the Father. Or your name. Put your name in there. Like, has been confessing Jesus before men. Now Jesus stands confessing Phil before the Father. That happens all the time in the heavenlies. All the time. Stephen sees it. This is Jesus who won the battle of the world. Showing us he won. You may think he didn't. He did win. See, the proper posture for a witness is stand up. And Jesus says, standing up, testifying to the Father that he's my guy, even though the court down on earth has damned him and is now executing him. The attorney of record, though, in this case is Jesus. And he stands at God's right hand as Stephen's representative, and he doesn't matter how loud the crowd is, he stands. Stephen is enduring, you know, Stephen is there at the right hand of God being faithful, and Jesus is standing there at the right hand of God being faithful. You can never out-faithful God, ever. And so there's two things at the end. Stephen, as he dies, says, Lord, he knows the story of Jesus. He knows Jesus sees him and is standing up for him. He says, Lord, receive my spirit. He knows he's dying. Stephen comes to death with faith that the death he must undergo has already been conquered by him who has endured it, Jesus. And that Stephen clearly is enduring and conquering with Jesus. I don't know about you, but I want the Holy Spirit to help me know when I'm dying, I'm dying with Jesus. I don't, there's nothing to be afraid of if you believe that. You know the second thing he does? He forgives. I mean, that is a remarkable miracle. He, he, he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Guys in this room, there's so many things you still hold. Turn them loose. Don't hold it against anybody. You think you've got a reason? You ain't got any reason. They're all excuses. We forgive because he has forgiven us. He is, you know what Stephen's doing? He's giving the forgiveness he's already received. That's all we do. And you know what's fascinating about this is there's there's a hateful young man who's holding their coats 
And you know what happens to Saul that day? He overhears the gospel. I think God's working on him right there. He overhears. Stephen, forgive the mob, including him. A great persecution breaks out. People are scattered all over the place. But look at the last point. The whole thing is not about us. It's about us scattering, preaching the kingdom. See, at the end of the story, remember what I said? That Satan did not come to attack Jesus' purpose, but rather his person. He came to attack Jesus so Jesus would be confused about his purposes. He failed with Jesus and he failed with Stephen. And so the storyline goes on, but it doesn't tell you all about any of these people. It tells you about the gospel. In spite of all this chaos, look what happened. Those scattered, those persecuted, those who were being harmed preached the kingdom good news wherever they went. Wherever they went. And so we are the benefactors of that to this day. That that's what the whole thing was about anyway. That's what this story's about, is that the purposes of God in the world will never be defeated, ever. The spread of the gospel. You know, it's about me. I hear, I, I'll talk to, you know, I went back to Abilene Christian, hadn't been there in a long time recently, and I talked to people who've kind of quit. And uh, they got attacked, they got, you know, strung up, so to speak, for lots of reasons. And in some ways, I think the purposes of God died. But it wasn't about us. I thought it was about me at 25. It wasn't. It was never about me. Still not. It's about the purposes of God. And so this morning, we got people sitting here who are disappointed with God. I just want you to know, he's not disappointed with you, and you need to, you need to really help, ask the Holy Spirit to help you get on past this. He's got, your pur- he's got purposes for you. There's some of us that think we're entitled to something he hadn't given us, and we're mad at him. And and the purposes of God are not working out in our lives. And a lot of us who are 60 years up to 80, we're just racked up in self-pity. We're old and tired, and we can't remember last year real well. And, (laughs) and, you know, what did I preach last week? So we got self-pity, and so we just kind of pull in and die in a sand trap somewhere. That's what we do. And so we all, we all got this thing that it's not a really about, it's about me. But I want to tell you what, it's not. From this day forward in your life, it's about the purposes of God in you. And, it's, and are you going to get out beyond whatever's happened that you can't get over with? You just can't get over it. Are you going to get over it or not? That's the issue for all of us. If we do, he'll use us. He uses people who've been hurt, especially. People who've been hurt. People who've been treated unfairly. He takes those people, and he redeems those people. And he changes their lives. And his purposes work through us. So may that happen here. May that happen. I love the way this whole thing ends. It doesn't end with us. It ends with God and his The proclamation of the kingdom is happening everywhere. So, Lord, just come and be among us this morning. May your purposes just explode in our lives. May your purposes explode in our lives. Pray for everybody that's stuck. Everybody. Whatever is causing it, that's stuck. Kind of going over and over stuff. Just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit's living water will come and move us. Move us all. Redeem us. Liberate us. Fill us with your Spirit. God, just bless all these wonderful people in this room. We, we declare that the Holy Spirit and everybody in this room is far stronger than Satan. That Jesus Christ is Lord of Satan. He has defeated Satan. And we have won the battle. The war is over. There's just some battles to mop things up. Help us, Lord.
Would y'all stand, please? Can we, uh, can we sing that? Just sing what you're playing there. We want to have an opportunity to pray with those there's Mark Whedon and others of you that have prayer ministry any of the elders here anybody else that wants to would you come down here we need we need some people to pray <clears throat> and I'd like for you to come and be prayed for if you're going through a time of testing a transition time a tough time just come and be prayed for or you're stuck you're stuck. Come on now, I know there's people here stuck and needing help. Let's just pray for each other. Come and be prayed for. Well, some of you there by Udi, not sure. They don't Would know you lay who your is. hands on him? Right here? Right there. Gather around Udi. He has some difficulties. He has some plans. There's some things coming against him. Please pray for him. Sing it. Let's sing it. I think if you were to write down the one-liner that summarizes the entire Bible, what is the entire Bible saying? What is it confessing? It is saying, our God reigns. The Lord reigns. In the book of Psalms, there's two themes. 
the Lord reigns, and take refuge in the Lord. Refuge. He reigns, take refuge. I don't think it changes. We just know more about the Lord. We know now he's died for us and he never lives to make intercession for us and the Holy Spirit lives in us. So go out to share that. So Lord, be with this church as we go out into the world where people have literally forgotten you reign. Help us to take refuge in you and the refuge in the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for music. Thank you for all the ways you help us to glorify you and love you. Thank you that we can confess you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, we just come to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and thank you. And thank you, Lord, that we get to go out there. We get to go out there in the world and announce that you rule. And the body says, amen, amen. amen. Bless you.